This short session is intended to give you an introduction to the risk assessment matrix, the RAM, and the basic steps of using the RAM. A risk assessment matrix is typically laid out on the premise of the risk being the multiplication of a severity of a consequence by the frequency at which it is likely to occur. What this allows is a matrix to be developed with the severity on one axis and the frequency on the other. Be careful here, as there are a few different terms that can be substituted in, including likelihood, probability, and consequence. There are many different types of risk matrix, as we can see. These can range from a small, simple, 2x2 two two grid up to a large, complex grid. They all tend to plot the severity against the frequency, the two components of risk. The matrix can be qualitative or quantitative. For a qualitative approach, guide words are used to define each severity and frequency category on the axis. For a quantitative approach, defined values are assigned to each axis. In his paper, What's Wrong with Risk Matrices, Tony Cox discusses the problems which may be encountered when using quantitative risk matrices. The paper is available online. Counterarguments are given in a different paper, What's Right with Risk Matrices, also available online. Most companies have a standard risk matrix template. If not, then there are guidelines available from regulators or industry bodies such as the example shown here from the International Oil and Gas Producers Association. This is a fairly typical qualitative risk assessment matrix. On the left we have severity, consequence, and across the top we have the likelihood. It looks pretty straightforward, so let's use a few examples to practice using it. First, let's consider electrocution, where the hazard is electricity. The risk score is arrived at by first asking, what is the worst credible consequence that may happen? In this example, a credible consequence would be a single fatality, i.e. a consequence level of 4 to people. And then by asking, what is the frequency of that credible consequence occurring or having already occurred? In this case, such an event has occurred within our company on a previous occasion i.e. a probability of C. Therefore, the risk score for people is derived as a 4C for the electrocution scenario. The matrix has the consequences broken down into four subcategories people, assets, environment and reputation. So we can use the same matrix to assess the risk to our physical facilities the environment, or our company's reputation, as well as the risk to people. This doesn't mean that a severity level 4 to people is of equal importance as a severity level 4 to the environment. It simply means that a single risk matrix template has been produced to cover the four types of event. Let's take a quick look at some other examples and how the matrix can be used for a few other hazards. The example here is a release of oil into a watercourse. We still approach this in the same way, only this time we have consequences which could affect the environment. I suggest that a consequence to the environment could be pretty large, perhaps a massive or level 5 severity. What about the likelihood? And this is where the engineering judgment and knowledge of the party using the risk assessment matrix really makes a difference. Inside the industry, most people can name a number of events where material has made its way into the environment. So let's assume our workshop team has suggested a likelihood of D, giving a risk ranking of 5D. Oil spills to the environment have happened at the location or more than once a year within our organisation. Right, 
Let's stop here for a second and talk about what we've just done. We did make a mistake. The mistake we made was to look at the worst case consequence and pair it with the worst case likelihood. This is a common mistake to make and it means we aren't using the matrix correctly. The correct approach is to match each severity with its own likelihood score. So the question we should have asked is how likely is the event with this consequence? Massive effect to the environment. For this more specific question we can correctly identify that massive environmental effects from an oil spill occur with a likelihood of B. We've heard of incidents in the industry but it doesn't happen every year and we haven't experienced such a massive event within our own organisation. Does this score apply to people though? For people, we could record two values. One for the worst case severity of a large release resulting in fatalities and one for the less severe effects of a minor spill. A catastrophically large event with fatalities from the spill is thankfully very rare. A likelihood level of A. Minor spills on the other hand resulting in only slight health effects, have occurred in our company and occur on a regular basis within the industry, a likelihood level of C. So in this instance we would record two risk values, a 4A for the large release and a 1C for the minor spell. Again, note that we don't pair up the worst case consequence and the likelihood. We don't record a combined score of 4C. This slide shows how we might prepare a register of all our hazards and risks. Moving left to right, first we identify all hazards present, perhaps using a checklist. Then we assess the risk to categorise the hazard into high, medium and low. So where does the risk assessment matrix fit into this process? It is a tool for assessing the risks, so it sits here. We use it to categorise our hazards into high, medium and low risks. Using the risk assessment matrix to do this is only the first step of risk analysis. So what do we do with this information? What we have as an output is a list of scenarios which can now be ordered from high to low risk. It is important that you decide how you are going to treat each hazard based on the risk score. For example, the scenarios in the orange section might be required to undergo further detailed risk analysis, whilst the risk in the blue zone might not require any further analysis. But what about the electrocution hazard, which had a risk in the yellow zone? What do you think should be done with this? We can also use the risk matrix to determine the right amount of risk control, i.e. the amount of prevention and mitigation measures we need to have in place for our hazards. For example, for hazards with a risk in the orange zone, we might need to have a diverse mixture of engineering and soft controls, automatic controls that don't rely on people to do things, and specific training and instructions. For hazards with a risk in the blue zone, it might be perfectly acceptable to rely purely on safety management systems. These manage our general workplace hazards. For hazards with a risk in the yellow zone, we might have some bespoke procedural controls in addition to the safety management system. Okay, we now know the basics of how to use the risk assessment matrix, the many different sizes and types available and how it can help us decide if we need to do further risk analysis or if we need to introduce further levels of control. This slide illustrates some of the advantages and disadvantages of using the risk matrices. They are a powerful, useful tool with many advantages but when used incorrectly or by people without the required experience they can lead to problems as we have already alluded to. This is just a short presentation 
to give you a brief introduction to the risk matrix method. Further information is available in the RISTAC risk analysis module. Thank you very much for listening.